Welcome to another edition of RCE. I'm your host, Brock Palin. I have with me my co-host, Jeff Squires from Cisco and the Open MPI Project. Hey, good afternoon, Brock. How's it going? Hey, Jeff. Having a good time. Uh, we have with us today um, two guys from the Slurm uh, Project, which I'm not exactly sure if it's a resource manager or scheduler or both, but we're going to find out. We have Mo Jetty. Hi. Um, you want a little bit of background here? So uh, I started at Livermore in 1980 doing operating systems development on the uh, Cray-1 computer with CTSS. That monster had uh, uh, 8 megabytes of RAM and an 80 megahertz clock. After working on that for about five years, I worked in mass storage for a few years and then went back to uh, operating systems work and scheduling, uh, including gang scheduling, some, uh, some work on Globus, distributed computing, and I've been working on Slurm since 2001. Okay, cool. Thanks. And we have with you your coworker, Danny Obel. That's right, yeah. I've been um, working here at the lab since um, 01. At first I started working with networking stuff, and around the 04, 05 time range, um, I moved into the Slurm project primarily for the BlueGene um, port. And I haven't let go of them since. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's what we've been doing. Well, don't turn this into a performance review or something like that right away. No, so you guys are both out to Livermore right now? Yes. Okay. So rolling into this, um, what exactly does Slurm stand for? Um, Slurm, it started out um, as a simple Linux utility for resource management is what it stands for now. But, I mean, as as most people know, it's, it's not just for Linux anymore. It also works for AIX and, and other flavors of Linux. And um, it has since gone from simple to, and we're thinking about replacing that with scalable. But um, that's that's really what it is, is um, a resource manager that just recently with the 2.0 release has been um, getting some scheduling logic. Okay, so it up till 2.0 it was just a resource manager? It had a really like minor um, like backfill or FIFO um, scheduler, but for the most majority of the people out there, they, they usually ran it with some sort of scheduler on top of it like Moab or Maui or some homegrown um, scheduler. Okay, and how did uh, Slurm get started? What's a little bit of the background and history of this? Well, it, it started back in 2001 when we were getting away from uh, proprietary operating systems and software into the world of Linux. And we looked at, uh, at, at where there were, there were shortcomings in the Linux environment, what, uh, what needed some, uh, some work. And we found two areas that we thought were uh, uh, important to address uh, scalability issues mostly. One was a, uh, a global file system, and we got involved in the, Linux, in the Luster effort uh, for that. And the other was in resource management. And from that, we, uh, we started the, the Slurm effort with Linux networks. Okay, so let me, let me ask you this. Why, you know, taking this into historical context here, I mean, why, why did the world need another resource manager at that time? Why did you do it? Did you do it mostly just for the sake of having an open source one? You know, was it to get away from proprietary, or were there specific features that were not addressed by the schedulers at the time? I'm sorry, the resource managers at the time, and, you know, how did, how did that come about? What was the decision-making process to, to embark on this project? Well, there, there, were, there were several issues. One issue uh, was, was something open source. We were, we were using Quadrix RMS at the time as a resource manager on, on most of our systems and, and load level on some of the IBM systems, both of which are proprietary. The other issue was uh, scalability. We, uh, we were looking not to scale to tens or hundreds of nodes, but uh, those of you who know Mark Seeger was saying, that, that's not nearly enough. We need to scale to tens of thousands of nodes, which, which meant basically rethinking everything in terms of resource management. A lot of the experts at the time felt that you couldn't go 
go above hundreds of nodes and thousands of processors, and here Mark's talking about something a couple of orders of magnitude larger than that. And, of course, that's the way it went, yeah. or it's going right now anyway. So who's, yeah. who's Mark Seeger? Uh, Mark is a deputy director of, of Livermore Computing, and, and he's been uh, involved in, in uh, procuring our, our uh, latest and greatest machines all along the line, the, uh, the ASCII uh, series and, uh, and, and Linux machines at very large scale. The, the other thing, uh, the other driving factor was we wanted something that would be highly portable, not just for Quadrix or, or a Federation switch on the IBM, but for any sort of switch, any sort of architecture. And in order to do that, we, we felt it was uh, important to, to structure the code uh, very carefully and, and make extensive use of, of plugins, which we do. So if, uh, if you want to use a new, uh, uh, a new network or a new topology or whatever, it's largely a matter of, of developing a new plugin for Swarm and leaving the kernel alone, which has been uh, uh, proven a very, very flexible design. I'm a big fan of plugins myself since OpenMPI is all about plugins too. Can you tell us a little bit about what kind of plugins do you have? I mean, how did you separate out the, the functionality into different types of plugins and what, what can you do with plugins in Slurm? Well, a lot of plug plugins came about by, um, like, I guess necessity. So, for instance, the, almost everything that's required for a BlueJean system is inside of a plugin, and that's called the select plugin. And so what it does is it will select the correct nodes. And so there's like a select linear for regular um, systems. And, and just recently in the 2.0, um, there's been a topology um, plugin added that will, um, will base around like three-dimensional topology or, or other, other types of topology that come down the road. Um, and that, that, wasn't necessi that wasn't needed until like just now when we're dealing with like a, like a Cray constellation system or something like that. Sun constellation. Oh, yeah, sorry. Sun constellation. But it's also usable on a Cray oh, yeah, yeah. similar architecture. Well, you, you mean Oracle constellation, right? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I, I couldn't resist. Yeah, <laughs> yeah Jeff, you're, you're hilarious. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but, um, but, yeah, so there's, there's plugins like which type of database are you going to use? So there's like a MySQL uh, plugin or a Postgres plugin. And all these things are called from the main code in different parts of the code, but if, they, if there wasn't a need for them, then they just wouldn't exist until there was a need for it. And so the way that Slurm is made is you can create a new type of plugin and just start calling it. Like a, a, at first, the topology was just part of the Slurm kernel, and then all the parts that were just like the linear topology or the basic one were moved into a basic plugin. And then we were able to just by calling like um, um, the plugin calls the hooks, you're able to branch that out and to do different things based on your um, your system. And and one of the uh, recent plugins that Danny developed was for scheduling for prioritizing workload. So uh, well we can get into that a, a little bit later if you'd like. But um, basically we've been taking the kernel and and pushing as much as we can out the plugins because that seems like the most flexible design. And, and when somebody's uh, building and installing Slurm on their system, it allows them to install a very simple environment if they want to in just a couple, three minutes. In fact, there's, a, there's an article on uh, Linux Magazine recently about building and installing a, a cluster in, I don't know, 23 minutes or something like that. And Slurm took two or three minutes of that. And if you want something that's a very sophisticated scheduler, uh, you can just pick and choose the right building blocks and, and make a, a fairly sophisticated scheduler using Slurm. Okay. Now, are you guys looking at doing modules mostly in-house, or are you trying to encourage an open source community around creating modules, or what are your plans there? Well, we obviously um, are doing coding in-house in right now, and, and we, we don't ever turn down people wanting to help. Um, we're all, <laughs> of course. Because right now it's, it's primarily Mo, Mo and I that, 
that do the coding, and there's there's obviously other people out there that help um, um, all over the world, actually. Um, but we're we're the primary gatekeepers, I guess you would say, of the Slurm code, and we we definitely are developing things that suit our needs. But that doesn't mean that there's not other people's needs out there that that we don't we don't look at. Oh yeah, we we get a lot of help from from computer centers and universities all over. And in, flat, in fact, uh, the world of open source software makes for some pretty strange bedfellows. We've got uh, uh, among our contributor, major contributors the National University of Defense Technology in China. Uh, we've got a nuclear weapons lab in Russia. We've got CEA in France, their, uh, their uh, uh, atomic energy uh, uh, center. Uh, so. I would imagine that makes some uh, pretty interesting paperwork for you to fill out working there in a in a United States DOE lab. <laughs> yeah, it, it it does make for uh, for some interesting paperwork and uh, and uh, I had a polygraph exam a few months ago that was especially interesting. <laughs> <laughs> well, who knew, kids? When you sign up to be a computer scientist, these kinds of things might happen to you as well. <laughs> But, but All right, so let me ask a let me ask a derived question here. Um, what's what's your software license for for Slurm, and and how does that affect both uh, internal and external software development? Say, for example, in the in the plugin realm. Um, the license that we use is the GPL um, version two license. Um, so anything that you contribute will probably need to be compliant with that. Um, most people don't have problems with that. Um, linking to our code would also mean that you have to sort of comply with that license also, which, which is a problem for co um, commercial um, like schedulers like Moab, where we have a, a plug-in just to, to handle the communication between schedules such as that called the Wiki plug-in. But in terms of, uh, of, of other development, HP and Bolt, to name two companies that have been major uh, Slurm developers, uh, they've, uh, they've wanted Slurm capabilities expanded in certain ways for, for their customer base, and, and their needs are definitely different from, from ours, uh, and they've got more manpower they can potentially apply. So because of the uh, GPL license, when they develop uh, a, a new Slurm plug-in or other Slurm enhancements, they have to feed it back to us. And in many instances, the work that they've done has eventually helped uh, help Livermore and other people. So we've, uh, uh, when people develop software and, and contribute it to Slurm, almost always it ends up in the main code base. So stepping back a little bit, the uh they mentioned how you can't link against it, but you can use something called the the wiki plugin. That that lets you control Slurm over like a socket or something really simple, right? You don't have to actually use your library. So that's like how Moab controls it. This wiki interface actually lets like say someone's doing some research on some scheduling algorithms, they can very easily write something that can control Slurm, right? Right. Um in in the case of uh of Moab and Maui, they use what Danny mentioned, a, a wiki interface that's basically just some XML over going over a socket. And for, for people who are developing their own scheduling software, their best bet is probably to develop a Slurm plugin. And because of the terms of the GPL license, if it's, uh, if it's just something they want to use in-house, they can, they can do that. But um, a lot of people who, who Develop stuff in-house or for research, uh, for research projects. Uh, you know, they'll feed it back to us, and if it's something that we feel is of uh, of general use, we'll pick that up and incorporate that into the main code base. So, if you guys like, you've mentioned bull and stuff from a lot of schools. Like, what fraction of the existing code do you say actually comes from sources outside uh, Lawrence Livermore? I'm going to guess somewhere around 30% comes from outside and 70% inside. It's actually quite a lot. Yeah. It's actually quite a lot. So that's, that's pretty impressive. So you got you got quite a few people who are actually getting their hands dirty. And, and is, is it mostly just all in the plugins where you're seeing most of external fingerprints? Most of it's in plugins. And, and, and that because because of, of how that's structured, it lets, lets people uh, – uh, 
do development work without having to learn the kernel of, of the Slurm code, and all the plugins are, are well documented, and basically all somebody needs to do is develop a library with a, a handful of functions. What's the uh, weirdest plugin, like the most unexpected plugin you've ever seen somebody come up with? Well, actually, one of the most surprising ones, and I won't say it's weird, but um, originally Slurm, again, taking uh, using the S there, the simple aspect of it, it originally just allocated whole nodes to jobs, um, and and HP. Uh, for their own customers needed to be able to allocate individual cores or sockets or on, on uh, clusters. So they did all that work within a plugin and made very, very few changes to the kernel of the code base. Now it was 4,500 lines of code uh, that you'd think needed to be in the kernel, but they were able to isolate all that in, in a plugin. Uh, other people, there, there's been work in, uh, in scheduling plugins. Uh, and and accounting, record keeping type plugins. Okay, so again, a, another derivative question. I'm, I, I keep doing this. Um, dig down a little deeper here. So y you know you have all these contributors. Um, do you do you run this as an open source project, or or do people mainly just submit stuff to to Mo and say you know here you go, um, you know we'd love to see you put this in or or do they see themselves you know, as full peers and you guys make decisions together and release decisions together and testing together and things like that? I mean, how do, how do you run this as, as a project? And, and this always, I love to hear about how other projects run themselves since I'm, I'm involved in an open source project, but everybody's got a, a different workflow and a different way of doing things. So I'm, I'm just curious to hear what, what yours is. Well, I'd be interested in hearing what yours is for the open MPI sometime, but uh, basically, most of our contributions come from, from the uh, corporate world, a, 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 HP and Bull, mostly. So when, when, it's, uh, when we're making plans for a new major release, we'll, we'll contact them, find out what their requirements are in terms of timing, in terms of capabilities they're, they're interested in adding, and, um, and, and try to work out something with them in terms of, of, of how it happens, potential. I mean, sometimes, you know, somebody will say, well, I want to work on this, and we're able to hook them up with somebody else who's interested in working in the same area. Uh, and, and the more people that are involved, typically, the better the, the end product is. And, uh, and then people will go off and work on, on designs, iterate with, with us on those designs, and, and potentially you know, other people, and then send in a patch. Uh, a after we get the, uh, the patch and, and get it integrated, uh, hopefully we, we get some, uh, some testing done as, as part of that. We've got a pretty extensive automated test suite, so it's, uh, it's really nice to get tests as part of the, uh, the code patch. Cool. All right. Well, I, I have to... Uh put in a plug for an earlier RCE cast. If you want to hear how the OpenMPI project runs, listen to RCE number one, I believe. I think we talked about that a bit in there. <laughs> a little self-serving plug. Had to do it. <laughs> well, they're all there for download still if anybody wants them. So they're all still there. That's right. So, so um, moving on to some of the gear this is actually running on, what's some of the larger systems or, you know, the largest public system? I know you guys were mentioning a lot of bomb labs there. But, uh, um, what's, uh, what's some of the larger systems you actually know Slurm's running on? Well, we know it's running on um, our big blue gene here. And um, how, how big is that? Well, it's got, according to, according to the top 500 there, it's got around um, 212,000 cores. Um, so it's running, on, it's running on a few blue, we have a few blue gene systems here. We have um, a couple of P systems. And, well, we have just one P system, I suppose, and we have a couple of L's that are quite large, I guess, in, in um, most people's standards. And um, I think that it's hard to guesstimate, but we, we figure that about 40% of the top 500 um, computers in the world that are on the list anyway are running Slurm. In terms of a conventional Linux-type cluster, I think the biggest system it's running on is uh, Thunderbird at Sandia, and that's 
What about 4,400 nodes? Yeah, about 45 actually. Okay. And uh, do you guys do anything um, unique to Slurm about the way you actually like kind of start up a job? We had the Tort guys on. They talked about they kind of had this uh, join model where all the PBS moms came together. Um, I was looking. You guys do something a little bit different than that to try to get to these larger scales. Yeah. So Slurm um, works off of a, like a tree fan out type thing, um, and the tree is built. There's no static um, links with the with so the way Slurm is, let's just give you a little hierarchical um, view of what Slurm is, is we have a controller that's on one node, and then each node has what's called a Slurm D, like a Slurm daemon, that sits there and um, looks, for, looks for information from either the controller or from a job launch. And, and so the, when the controller starts up a job or wants to communicate with anybody, he, he spans out a tree based on a configurable width. Um, based on how big your system is, and so you can you can dial that to be whatever you want to get the fastest communication, and then they they spawn their answers back up through the tree, and then the tree gets torn down behind itself. And the same thing happens with job launches. Is whenever a job launch comes through, it it spans out, and so that that a re reduces quite a bit of traffic on your um, network, and and it um, speeds things up a heck of a lot faster. It's also uh, fault tolerant, so if a node drops out, it'll it'll work self around. It'll self heal. So that uh, that's that definitely uh, is is a big boost to uh, scalability for Slurm. Okay, and then uh, actually, almost uh, Jeff would uh, be a better um, a answer to this maybe, but you guys know, does uh, Slurm have an interface for helping MPI uh, startups? Like Slurm? the actual, um, similar to the TM interface on the uh, PBS. Slurm supports quite a few different flavors of MPI, and and how those MPIs start, um, it it really depends on on what flavor of MPI you've got. Uh, we support uh, PMI for uh, MPitch2 and MVPitch2 for uh, Open MPI. Something I've just recently added is some some support for uh, port reservations and allocating ports on nodes, so that we'll be able to start up all those tasks immediately, and they'll have port and host information right out of the right out of the chute, and be able to uh, open up communications to each other immediately. So what's uh, this is? I mean, we're starting to talk about some of the specific features about Swarm here. What what's what makes Slurm great? I mean, I'm a, I'm a little biased because I run Slurm on my Cisco development cluster for all my MPI testing, and so I know the things that I like about Slurm and why I chose Slurm. But for someone who's never used it and, and maybe looking at getting a cluster of their own, whether it's small or mid-sized or large or whatever, why why would they choose Slurm over something else? What what is cool about Slurm? What are the what are the great features that are genuinely useful to to people? Well, yeah. both to people and to administrators. Well, I would I would say um, talking referencing that article that Mo was um, talking about just a few minutes ago, it, it's easy. It's it's not the hardest part of setting your cluster up. <laughs> um, the, it really is pretty simple to set your cluster up. We've we've heard it from um, multiple people. Um, sometimes we don't even realize that that the sites are using Slurm until months after they've already set it set it up on and standardized it on their whole cluster set. And then they're like, oh, by the way, we have this we have this question about this random spot in Swarm. We're like, oh, when did you guys start using it? Type of thing. <laughs> and um, so that that in of itself, the the whole simple aspect of it. I mean, it can easily get complex if you wanted to. But the if you just if you're just at home and you had a, like three or four boxes you want to throw together, it's really it's really simple to set the, the whole thing up. Um, that's just one one aspect. The the whole scalability issue that we just talked about before. I mean, I don't I don't foresee a, a system in the near future or 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 close to the near future that Slurm won't scale to. And and given uh, my experience with computers, the sort of uh, you know state of the art machines we deal with here at the labs are the type of machines that people will see in see in their homes in a couple couple of decades. So when you're your grandkid asked for the uh, 
PlayStation 18 or whatever that has uh, 100,000 cores, it might very well be running Slurm. <laughs> that would be pretty funny. Sony Slurm, you know? <laughs> Well, you got to manage those um, cores somehow, you know. That's true. They don't do it on themselves. So, still, could you could you break it down a little bit better? What I mean, what's unique about Slurm? What's uh, what are what are some of the nice features that people like to use? I mean, why why do people choose Slurm other than just the simplicity? Simplicity, scalability, um, the plugin very, model. The plugin model. In, in the event that it, if if you want to do development on your own or tweak things, it's very easy to do that. Um, the commands are very uh, flexible too. For example, if you want to get information about jobs or or the nodes in the system, uh, you can you can format the output any way you want, report any fields that you're interested in, sort any way you want to. We've got Perl APIs available, so if you want to roll your own tools, it's easy to do that. That's actually made it easy. Um, there's in the there's there's a configuration directory that we have that um, contains such such things as um, like torque wrappers. So you can, in theory, switch your system from torque to slurm and put these wrap pearl wrappers that use the slurm APIs, um, and that your users don't even have to know that you've switched. <laughs> hmm, cool. You could do that with other schedules, your schedulers. Do you think? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, that's one Slowly point. switching the world, one cluster at a time. <laughs> so from, from an admin's point of view, if you did want to go to Slurm and you're like, oh, I don't want to have any heartburn with my users, you could easily write these things so that, or, or use the ones that already exist, and you, your users might not even need to know that you switched it, and, and there you go. Huh. Yeah, no, so uh, the plugins. What are those written in? You mentioned Perl in there. Can I actually write like a if I just need to do a little thing and I'm more versed in Perl than I am in C or something? You know what what are the plugins normally written in, and then what can they be written in? Well, the the code base is um, ANSI C, and so that's that's what most most all of the the Slurm proper code is. Now the we talked about the Perl APIs. Those were actually a gift from our friends in China. Um, <laughs> That they they um, d interface directly with Slurm through a through a PM that is based off of a .xm, um, which is linking directly to the the .so from Slurm. Yeah, look at me and all my dots. <laughs> but um, it's real alphabet too. Yeah. So the so the Perl APIs are extremely handy for if for if you want to do one thing or the other and it's really small. You can interface directly with Slurm, get structures back in the form of Perl, and not have to worry about like having um, having to look at output from a existing Slurm function. You can just get the raw data yourself. Huh, that that's really handy because every now and then I, I wish I could just do a little tweak. Yeah, so you would be able to do that. Yeah, I actually, I, I can't say I go that far, but on my own cluster, I have a couple of aliases that uh, that use some of the very flexible commands that uh, that you mentioned earlier. That uh, you know, I I want to see the Q output, but I want to see it in a, in a very specific way, right? Or I want to uh, list, you know, ordered on a specific field or something like that. And it, it's nice. It's very definitely nice to have the power to be able to do that without touching any source code at all. It's just I can tweak the command line, or I know if I. I I've known about the Perl abilities there for a little while, but I haven't really explored anything with it because um, I haven't really needed to simply because even just the command line itself was flexible for yeah. what I needed to do, and that was cool. And there are environment variables that can control the output and formatting of most of the commands too. So if you, if, if you just want to always look at it in a certain way uh, rather than an alias, you could just set up an environment variable that that specifies which fields you want to see in what order or whatever. Hmm, cool. Well, by uh, you know, I'm a I'm a C coder by definition, which means I change my mind ten times a day. So I've got uh, twenty different ways that I like to look at the queue. <laughs> so I've got about that many aliases. Oh, that works fine too. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, do you guys do uh, any type of uh, Kerberos ticket passing for say AFS, which has been a problem of mine for? 
years, which is as long as I've been doing this. The, uh, the people are at CEA are working on that right now. Um, it's not available to the public, but uh, hopefully it will be soon. And there's, I believe they actually have it working, correct? They have it working correctly, and there's a uh, uh, an entry on SourceForge for it. I believe it's called Aux, A-W-K-S, but I don't know if the code is out there today. And it's going to take the form of a Slurm plugin. Okay. So we, we already mentioned MPI. Uh, is there any other tools out there? Like, Is there like a grid system or, say, uh, Oh, like one of these cloud services using Slurm. What, what other type of tools hook directly into Slurm that you've seen out there? Uh, well, LSF and Moab and Maui that we mentioned. Danny mentioned the, uh, the Torque or PBS command wrappers. And as far as I know, that will, that will work uh, for Globus. So if you've got some tool that works with with uh, Torque or PBS today, you could put Slurm in place uh, of, of uh, PBS or Torque and put in the, uh, the command wrappers, and you should be good to go. So let me dive a little deeper on that. So I think what Brock was getting at there was he's saying, you know, MPI, you support a different bunch of, of job startups for MPI, and, and various MPIs hook into Slurm in, in different ways. Is, you know, the PMIPI or they fork exec S run or something directly or, or whatever. Are there any other tools besides schedulers and besides MPI, say like system administrator tools or resource administrator tools or something that, you know, a, a human would actually interact with and under the covers it's just talking to Slurm directly? Well, we've got a, a number of local tools that interface to it um, in terms of generally available things. Um, I'm guessing that's the same everywhere, though. I mean, you talk to other places, and they've developed a lot of things that just aren't, that are based off of something they've already used in the past, and they've just ported it to Slurm, so to speak. Um, so it's, 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 hard to, it's hard to say that there's, or one way or the other on, like, commercial software out there that's, that does what you're talking about. It, I don't know. But you can have monitors that, uh, you know, check for temperatures or voltages or whatever and and can easily drain nodes if there are problems anticipated. That's, that's one of the areas that we're starting to get into some more uh, watching for signs of, of impending failures and being able to to drain nodes and take other actions if, uh, if, if we think something might be going bad. Oh, so you can actually have a uh, Slurm monitor the health of a node? Well, not Slurm directly, but other tools monitoring it, and they can talk to Slurm if they see something abnormal happening. And, and uh, when, when uh, a node is, say, drained in Slurm, you can include in that a description of what happened. So you can, you know, you can say no drained at such and such a time because, you know, uh, I'm, I'm, seeing, uh, I'm seeing the temperature rise or whatever. And, and Slurm also has a trigger mechanism so that when that event occurs, it could trigger an email to be sent to, say, a system administrator to investigate it when he comes in in the morning. Okay. So, so actually, that's a pretty good uh, lead-in to you know what's what's new in Slurm 2.0. So you mentioned that uh, you know 2.0. I think as of this recording, we're still in RC candidate, but uh, by the time this goes, well, what, what's your timeline for actually releasing 2.0 and and what's new in it? Well, right now we have um, a few. It's probably going to be the timeline is going to probably be about two two weeks. Probably right now is what we're looking at within two weeks. Um, that that's ob obviously a a uh, shot in the dark guess, but um, that's that's what our plans are right now. But so you're, you're aiming like towards the end of May, is what you're saying? Yeah, so yeah say May twentieth yeah. or so. Yeah, probably right before your uh, Memorial Day weekend. So you know, you can load it up on your. Perfect. Computer. Release it Friday and then disappear for three days. Yeah. <laughs> See you later. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so 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 that's that's our plans on right now. The the whole. The whole release candidate. This is actually um, going to bring up something else that we're we're changing our release format. Um, in the past, I don't, if anyone's kept track with Slurm, 
you could get quite a bit different slurm in the in the like the the minor releases like the one three to dot one to one three dot two could have quite a bit more functionality in it. Um, we're we're actually changing that model so that the the minor releases will only um, contain um, bug fixes. Just just some background on that. We're really forced into that model because our environment here was changing so quickly that um, you know we needed to make major changes fairly quickly and. Uh, our, our management here wouldn't let us roll out major releases. So basic, basically all the APIs needed to stay the same, although potentially some significant changes were happening under the cover yeah. in terms of functionality. Yeah. And when I say minor, I actually mean uh, macro. So yeah, sorry about that. I mean macro. But um, yeah, so starting with 2.0, the only releases that will be 2.0 will be bug fixes, and feature enhancements will be in the next release, which will be 2.1, which is, I think right now we're setting fall, fall, fall of 09. Yeah. But um, as for the change between 1.3 and 2.0, the main, the main difference is the scheduling logic, which we talked earlier about, um, is the ability to schedule on multi, which is called a multi-factor scheduler. Um, you can do it on like, like age, so job size, fair share. It's based off of a uh, um, most most of the 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 guts of it is based off of the the database integration that we started in one three um, with the 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 accounting and the accounting is done off of a a fair share hierarchy so you can have multiple levels of um, of density in the in the fair share which is which is pretty unique and and nice to do inside the slurm. Um, so that's one thing. That so, so just just to give a little example. Yeah. So for for example, you used to have uh, you know different projects and divide up the resources at, at each level. So so chemistry gets 30% of your resources and physics gets 40% or whatever. And a, and an important factor of, in that is uh, we we have coordinators at each level. We you know individuals are identified that can actually control resource allocations of the users or groups. Uh, that are under their control, so they're, you don't have to call up a hotline saying, I want to change Joe's allocation from 5% to 10% of our resources. He can just do it himself. Or if, they're, um, or if they have a trouble user in their group that just won't listen to them, they can just dumb down their, their fair share allocation so they just don't get as many cycles as everyone else in the group. So that's, that's, that's one of the, the major reasons that we went from 1.3 to 2.0 as opposed to just 1.4. Let me ask you a clarification question on that. Are you going to be preserving the, uh, the simple side as well for users like me? I mean, I, I essentially have a single user cluster. I mean, it's me. I, I have no need for, for fair share. A, a trivial backfill it really is, is all that I need. Is that stuff still going to be there? For you, it turns out that there's a plug-in because all this was done in a plug-in surprise. But um, <laughs> a plug-in called Basic. Oh no no, we're gonna we're gonna name one Jeff, aren't we? Yeah yeah, just Jeff. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. For for everyone else. Make sure it only works about fifty percent of the time. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Sweet. But yeah, the 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 all of all of the scheduling logic for this is is called inside of a a plugin called the Priority plugin, and so once again it was it the What's in the basic plugin, which is the basic priority plugin, is was once in the the Slurm kernel and then moved into this this new plugin, and then the the new plugin that does all this magic about fair share and and just mucks around with the priority is called the multi-factor plugin, and so the default is basic, and so you'd have to turn this on. So you, Jeff, running a simple cluster, wouldn't even need to know about this stuff. Yeah, we definitely wanted to keep it simple for somebody who just, you know, wants basic job scheduling, resource management in a in a in a simple class. Yeah. Yeah. So um You won't see any difference. Yeah, you could you could just switch over and your old form dot com file will will suit you just fine. Excellent. Yes. So have you guys looked at doing anything like uh there's a lot of talk about like powering down nodes and VMs and 
stuff like that. Are you, you guys looking at doing anything like that? Uh, subject very near and dear to my own heart. Well, you're in luck because that actually is in this in this release also. Yeah, we've uh, we've just added logic to power down nodes, and I know Jeff's been kicking the tires on that, and and has filed a couple of problem reports for me to look at, but. Uh, unfortunately, given the size of the code and the number of people involved and uh, other things happening, uh, I haven't gotten around to it quite yet, Jeff, but it's in my <laughs> list. Yeah. Well, that's okay because, I mean, you know, we're, we're getting pressures internally here in Cisco like, oh, we need to be green, you know, turn off resources when you're not using them. And, and it's also just, it's just the right thing to do, you know, because my, like I said, I have a, I have a fairly unique single user cluster and uh, most of the time, it's running stuff, but there are times when I'm just not doing anything, and it would be, it's, <laughs> to be honest, I'm too busy, and I'll never remember to turn off the nodes by myself, but if my, my resource manager can turn them off and then, you know, power them back on on demand, boy, that would just be awesome um, on, on so many levels. So I think it's fantastic that this possibility is even partially there right now, and, and I am, well, <laughs> I'm Mr. Open Source Guy, so I'm very happy to help, and and help to bug this stuff out so that this becomes a useful utility for, for everybody because I, yeah, I just love it. We do appreciate your help there. And, and um, you know, you talked about a small cluster. I mean, here, uh, you know, we turn on a new cluster and it can dim all the lights between here and Hoover Dam. So the, the greener we can be and power down nodes in the weekends if they're idle, uh, it could make a really big difference, truly. Yeah, huge, especially when if your power bill is like millions of dollars a month or something. Yeah, we actually take a little bit of a different approach to that. We try to make types of scheduling policies so flexible that, you know, and basically everything's in use always <laughs> instead of just sitting there idling. Um, we've we've kind of gone the other direction, and we just try to minimize the amount of hardware we have. If if you've got enough work, I mean, sometimes on the weekends where we go idle, so. Uh, oh, you're so lucky. It it depends on your environment. Uh, I'd be happy yeah, and it, it can happen. It can happen for me too. You know, my cluster can go idle for uh, a variety of different reasons. Like, you know, my cluster is mainly used for regression testing of OpenMPI, but sometimes, you know, somebody will commit a compile error to the tree, and it just won't build that night. And therefore, I've got 23 and a half hours to do nothing because there's nothing to test. And so, you know, sometimes the work will just get slashed. Um, yeah, uh, there, there's a variety of reasons when I why I can go idle. So, you know, I think it's a this this will be great functionality. Like I said. Yeah. So yeah. Once again, we we appreciate anyone and everyone testing our code. And Jeff, you you've definitely helped us out on it quite a bit. So. We well, do me a uh, do me a favor, and I, I know I don't want to touch on a religious topic here, but please don't go to GPL three <laughs> because that would uh, that would preclude me from looking or touching the code at yeah. all. We've actually had that discussion, and I don't think that that's the way we're going right now. Well, from a personal note, I, I think that's great. I, everybody's got their own opinion, and I certainly don't want to step on anybody's opinion, but uh, that is most useful to me. Good, good. We'll, we'll definitely write that one down. <laughs> well, um, on, on something similar to this, um, in the 2.0 um, release, we actually can boot different operating systems on the nodes. We can down like like for say some some scientist wants oh I, I want this version of um, Linux or I want this kind of OS running on the nodes we can we can set it up so that Slurm will go down the nodes and then boot that kernel or something. It's, it's leveraging the, a lot of that same logic that we do for powering down nodes. So uh, do you do that just by messing around with the bootloader or do you actually reloading the machine? We, we just run, uh, you know, it, a system administrator can define a, a Slurm script to run based upon uh, what the user requests, and at this point it's pretty simple, so if, if you want to limit certain operating systems to certain users or limit the capability to certain people, it's, it's all pushed out to user land at this point. It's just a matter of running a script, and that either booting a new operating system or returning an error, for example. Okay, so they could, basically the site could do it any way they wanted to. Yeah. Flexible. I mean, we, might, we, we might add 
you know, more infrastructure and slurm down the road, but for right now, that seems to, uh, to satisfy uh, customer requirements, and we'll just see how that goes. Yeah, no, I mean, that, that's really a flexible, whether somebody's using, like, an XCAT diskless system or, you know, there's, there's many different ways that, you know, a cluster can be built that just ends up booting Linux in the end. You know, so Slurm can handle that. It's just, you know, you're not pigeonholed in any one site into you have to boot a machine this way. So that's right. quite nice. That's flexible. Yeah, I have to say that, it, you know, my experience with system administrator type 2 is they're, they uh, they don't want to be pigeonholed. They just say, give me a script, and then I can have that script do whatever I want to do. So just give me a give me a hook, and with that hook I will I will move my own mountains, but, you know, you don't care or know how I want to move my mountains. Yeah, I am kind of that way. <laughs> yeah, I'll admit that I fall into that camp. <laughs> you know, so, so what, uh, oh, go ahead. Yeah, I was just gonna say, what, what's beyond 2.0? What's uh, what's coming up in uh, version, uh, you know, Slurm 10? <laughs> Slurm 10. Well, I actually, I wanted to touch on a couple of other things that are in 2.0. Oh, know. okay, go ahead. Uh, support for uh, checkpoint restart using uh, the Berkeley Lab checkpoint restart and also uh, advanced reservation. So you can say, uh, you know, reserve 16 nodes for user Bob every day at noon or whatever. One, one cool thing about the advanced reservation is that you can set flags for like maintenance or something. And so when a node is downed in the accounting um, land, this is um, one of the requirements from other, other um, labs was that you say that this was a planned downtime or this is unplanned downtime. And so in the Slurm accounting, you can you can say, okay, well, I have a reservation here for maintenance, and then all the down notes that happen during that time in that reservation won't be counted against your system utilization as like, oh, something happened to the system. This was a, a known quantity that was going to happen. Right. And these reservations are all tied into the accounting, like Danny said. So if you reserve 16 notes for user Bob at noon, and he's out to lunch and forgets to use it, we still charge him for it or at least account for it. Yeah, and, and you, can, <laughs> you can get reports on this through the S-Report tool about um, what the utilization of your, of your reservations were or your cluster or whatever. It's good to know that the tax man even exists for your cluster as well. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> we get our share. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> So, so uh, getting back to your original question there about what's what's coming down the pike, I mean, given our limited manpower, I mean, at, at Livermore, we're really focused on what our internal needs are, and uh, a couple of those needs are uh, we've got a, a, a procurement uh, called for a Peloton system. It's going to be a 20 petaflop system, and we're looking to get a uh, blue team queue for that. So there'll be some fairly significant changes required for that. Hopefully, we can put all that in a plug-in, uh, which will which will make it easier. Uh, we're we're doing some work on failure anticipation that I already mentioned. Another thing is is Linux containers so that we can uh, better constrain jobs to certain resources, especially in terms of memory use. And we're we're also looking to uh, now we've gotten into scheduling, but we're also looking to be able to support uh, uh, an enterprise-wide environment. I mean, you can run accounting and see what jobs were run throughout the environment, but right now using Slurm, you can't submit a job on one machine, run on another machine. So we're going to start looking at, at being able to, uh, to execute some of these Slurm commands to, to see the environment on the different clusters and move jobs from cluster to cluster. Uh, I don't see being able to take on full-blown enterprise-wide scheduling a la LSF in the immediate future, but they've got 500 people and we've got just a few. Uh, there's definitely more work happening in terms of scheduling and, and accounting uh, happening from outside of Livermore for people who, who want to uh, take an open source route in, in that area. And, uh, you know, Slurm is very widespread. Uh, I, I'm not sure what other large machines are coming down the pike at other, at other centers like Sandy and Los Alamos, but uh, support for hybrid machines and uh, who knows 
who knows what down the road. Okay, as a, as a developer, um, I mentioned earlier, it's always interesting for me to uh, hear, you know, how other projects, uh, open source in particular, run themselves and whatnot. But another question I always have to ask is, what do you guys use for version control? What's what's your source control tree for the Slurm code base? We use Subversion. Um, our, our main um, repository is actually running 1.4 right now. But I believe that that's going to change to 1.5 pretty soon. Okay. Any particular reason you guys went with Subversion? We actually started with um, CVS and switched over to Subversion. Um, I'm not really sure what the, the the methodology behind it, but I I personally like Subversion a lot better than um, CVS. Yeah, this is, a, this is a common story we hear quite a bit. People started it with CVS. The same is true for OpenMPI. We started with CVS, and once Subversion hit 1.0, we, we switched and uh, uh, have not looked back until actually very recently. So. But yeah, we're, we were thrilled to move from CBS to Subversion. That was really good. So guys, thanks a lot for taking some time out and speaking with us. Uh, this show will be up soon. And you can find it off the website, uh, www.rce-cast.com. There's an RSS feed, iTunes, subscribe. Um, also, before we go, where can we find Slurm and where can people download that? Slurm is available from SourceForge. And... Um, our, our website is uh, at Livermore, let's see, HTTPS, uh, I'm going to have you edit this out here for a second. Okay, HTTPS, computing.lnl.gov slash Linux slash Slurm. Or just Google Slurm and you shouldn't, have any, you shouldn't have any trouble finding it, uh, yeah. although it might get a little confused with, uh, with the uh, Futurama beverage by the <laughs> <laughs> the, the, the so if you, if you Google yeah. for Slurm in Linux, it'll probably come up. Yeah. You know, if you if you Google for Slurm, if you actually type Slurm in your um, URL on Firefox, it usually brings our site up. That's what it, the case on my system is anyway. Cool. Uh, Always good to be the number one Google search result. <laughs> but uh, if you type it into Google, it's it's easily in the top there someplace. So. It's up to me. Okay, cool. Hey, you guys have a boff every year at uh, um, uh, SE? Yeah, we uh, we had one last year and uh, the year before, and uh, hopefully this coming year we'll be giving a tutorial, but we'll we'll have to see the results of our proposal. Okay. Okay, yeah, because those, those boffs are always a good place to kind of pick up and learn some new stuff, so I definitely enjoy those every year, so. Well, there's, there's so much that's changed in Slurm 2.0 um, uh, that, that I think a, uh, a tutorial should be uh, very useful. Okay. Okay, well, cool. Thanks a lot, guys, for taking some time out to speak with us. Thanks a lot for um, taking some time. Appreciate your time today. Thanks, guys. Thank All you. Right. Thank you. Yep. Thank you. Bye.